I want to talk about some of the important problems in data mining and machine learning, starting with classification, which I've already given you an introduction to. But in any case, uh, let's go over it for just notation again. Okay, so in classification, we have the input, which is x, y pairs, which are called, so each, each data point is called an example or an instance with a label or an observation or a data point or whatever you want to call it, or a unit. Uh, in any case, um, they are x, y pairs. You have n of them, generally. Now, the x, i are vectors. Uh, in a space of dimension P. So for instance, if you're doing an image, then P would be the number of pixels in the image times three, because you have RGB values for each pixel. And then for binary classification, the labels are plus one and minus one. You can have a classification that has a, like, you can, there's all different variations of classification where you can have uh, multiple labels that you want to um, as, as the outcome. And then your goal is for binary classification, your goal is to try to take these data and um, in the high dimensional space in which they live, you wanna create a classifier, which is a function that separates the positives from the negatives. And the decision boundary is where that function is zero. So you're gonna use the sign of that function to make the classification there. And again, here's a whole bunch of different applications. So handwriting recognition, speech recognition, um, all kinds of biometrics, like biometrics, like fingerprint recognition. Like if you put your fingerprint into a machine, it has to recognize, is that person you or not? And if so, let's, let's allow you to open the door. Uh, uh, retinal scanners, things like that. Document classification, where you take the document, you put it into a scanner, and you want to know what is actually in that document. Uh, detecting fraudulent credit card transactions, and so on and so forth. Now, the second problem is a kind of a vari variation on a theme, where uh, instead of predicting yes or no, you're going to predict the probability of yes. Okay, so uh, the input is, again, these xy pairs. Um, and then the output is a function f, which is as close as possible to the probability that y equals one. So instead of saying yes or no, you say, okay, what's the probability of yes? And then if there's many, many applications for this. So you might wanna estimate the probability of failure of a machine or probability of a person to default on a loan, or you could um, estimate the probability that a person will have a heart attack next year. There's many, many different uh, medical applications for these kind of uh, conditional probability estimation questions. Now, regression is where the labels are real valued. In regression, your goal is to predict some sort of some sort of real valued quantity, such as an individual's income next year, or the price of a house if it will sell, uh, if it's on the market, or you could predict uh, demand for energy and predict uh, test scores for students. So predicting demand for energy is actually a really important application because for power companies, so power needs to be consumed as soon as it's produced. So the power company needs to predict very, fairly precisely how much energy is going to be consumed every day. And so it can produce exactly that much power. So every day power companies predict the demand for energy for the following day, it's called the day ahead problem. And then uh, with, that, with that estimate of the demand, they figure out what kind of, uh, what, what type of power to use, whether they're going to, you know, fire up a, a, a big plant that takes a whole day to, to set up, or if they're going to use um, kind of short-term, dirtier um, types of energy. Anyway, it's, a, it's an interesting problem. Okay, the problem of supervised ranking is kind of right in between classification and regression. So for supervised ranking, the labels actually involve pairs of observations. Okay, so you have your input data. Let's say that they're movies. And then your labels are whether one movie should be ranked above another movie. Okay, so in other words, um, you don't actually, you, in this case, you may not get like a full, like a, a rating for each movie. You just know that the person went to see two movies and they like this one better than they like that one. Uh, and this is, that actually makes sense because very often people's numerical scores change based on what time of day they see the movie and <laughs> other things like that. 
Okay, so if you at least ask, well, which movie's better than, you know, is this movie better than that movie, then you at least get a ranking. So those rankings are actually your labels. And then your goal is to create a function such that if you take two movies uh, whose features are known, you want to know whether one movie should be ranked higher than another movie. Okay, so that's, that's the goal of supervised ranking. It's like create a function that will rank correctly for new pairs of observations. Okay, uh, search engines are, are, they often use supervised ranking methods because they want to make sure that their rankings are correct, right? Uh, they want to make sure that the correct, that, that this web page, which is more relevant to the query, is ranked above this web page, which is less relevant to the query. Uh, also, ranking methods are very useful for predictive maintenance applications because for predictive maintenance, you can only maintain one piece of equipment you know, at a time. Uh, so I spent a, lo a, a, a long time in my life, years, three or four years, even more, trying to predict which, uh, which manholes in New York City were going to have a fire or an explosion as a result of a problem in the underground electrical grid in New York. And so here our goal was to rank the manholes in order of most likely to explode to least likely to explode. And so we would use supervised ranking methods to try to, try to determine in what order the manholes should be ranked for repair. Also, um, there's another, there's a whole genre of problems in data mining, which are to find correlations in large data sets where uh, you don't have labels here. All you have are the X's you have the features. Sometimes you have the labels, I should say. Like sometimes you have them, but you don't need to have them to, to work on this type of problem. And then your goal is just to find correlations or patterns in, the, in those data. The most famous example of this is this whole diapers implies beer, beer example. This is a really cool example. Um, the story goes <laughs> that supermarkets were looking at their databases and they noticed that people who buy diapers also buy beer. Uh, and so they would, the idea is that the, once the grocery store noticed this, they realized that these were, you know, men coming for their uh, weekly beer runs and they would, weekly diaper runs and they would combine it with their big weekly beer runs. And so if they put the diapers and the beer at certain locations in the grocery store, then they would sell more of each. Unfortunately, that story is totally false. It's just a made up story, but it's a beautiful motivator for why you'd care about looking at correlations in data. But there are honest to goodness correlations that people look at in customer data that are real and that do uh, have important um, <laughs> implications for how you would organize a, a grocery store or another type of store or an online store. Okay, so the type of algorithms involved in this are frequent item set mining algorithms, where you just try to find patterns that occur frequently in the data. Now, clustering is another whole field of machine learning where your goal is to group together, group data into clusters that belong together. So these are where, in each of these clusters, the cluster should be relatively sort of compact, um, and each cluster should be kind of far away from other clusters. So these would be like groups of, customers, for instance, that all kind of behave the same way. Like this cluster would be young parents who need diapers, and this cluster would be old people who need, you know, whatever they need, and this cluster would be uh, whatever, um, students, okay. All right, so the input are just x's and the output is um, k clusters, right? You just divide your data into these k clusters. And I've listed a bunch of applications here. Uh, clustering consumers for market research, clustering genes into families based on the way that genes behave over time. Uh, and uh, image segmentation is actually a form of clustering where you take an image and then you have to divide it into different pieces. Like this is a medical image and here are the lungs and here are the, here's the rib cage and here's this and here's that. Okay, um, density estimation is the last problem I'm gonna talk about, which is also unsupervised. Um, so in density estimation, Again, you have no labels, right? That's what it means to be unsupervised, where there's no labels for supervision. And you, you just have the data, and your goal is to create a function that tells you how popular each point in the feature space is. Okay, so your goal is to create a function f that's as close as possible to the density of x at each point. 
So if, your, if a particular value of x is very uncommon, then the density should be very close to zero. On the other hand, if you know, a particular feature vector is very, very common, then your density would be high. Um, so I've given an example of this like uh, anomaly detection, so anomalous mechanical behavior of a piece of equipment. So if your equipment is operating normally, then its feature vector should be in a part of the space that's relatively common. Whereas if the machine is behaving anomalously, then the density in that part of the feature space should be kind of close to zero. Okay, so I've given you a whole lot of different machine learning problems. A number of them are supervised, which means you have a label that you can learn from. And then you have um, unsupervised methods where there's no label. Uh, I should mention that supervised learning is a lot easier to study in some ways because um, when you have that label for supervision, you can you can you can use the label to judge the quality of your classifier. Whereas if you're doing something with like clustering, it's really hard to judge the quality of uh, of a clustering. Now, um, I will mention something in common to all of these problems, which is that we don't necessarily assume we know the distribution from which the data are drawn. We simply assume that the data are representative of some underlying distribution that somehow provides these data for us. And if the future is like the past, then hopefully the data that we have will help us care, you know, the models that we create from the data we have will hopefully carry, carry on and be valuable into the future. And that's uh, that's sort of the the kind of what a, a kind of a key principle of machine learning that you know the the future is like the past and so if you understand the patterns in the past you can use those patterns to predict the future. Thanks.